Okay. All right. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast this week coming to you from the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. My name is Dan Schreiber. Please welcome to the stage the other three elves. It's Anna Chizinski, James Harkin, and Andy Murray. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days, and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with you, Andy Murray. My fact this week is that the first man to swim the English Channel later had a show where he floated in a tank for two hours. (laughs) That was his show. Uh, His name was Matthew Webb. And um, to get extra funding, he would do a special endurance show where he floated in a tank for 128 hours. Wow. Whoa, that's yeah. one hour better than the guy stuck in the rock. Yeah. <laughs> Probably as interesting as well in terms of a feature-length movie. Yeah. Did um, he, with, I mean, without a flotation device. Without a flotation device, without, yeah. I mean, that's really impressive. It's very impressive. Yeah, 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 in a boat, it's not quite as impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it's just basically a big swimming pool, right, where he's just paddling around. Yeah, I'm treading water, I guess, is what he was doing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So he wasn't lying on his back. That's not floating. I think that's just swimming. Like a child. We got very philosophical very early on, haven't we? (laughs) Um, The first time he ever did this kind of floating for as long as possible, it was against a Newfoundland dog. He had a bet that he'd be able to float for longer than a dog, and he won his bet. Did the dog die? (laughs) (laughs) As they fished the dog out. Victory for Webb. I mean, did the dog even know it was taking part in a bet? (laughs) (laughs) Captain Webb won a year's supply of pedigree chum. (laughs) So this this is Captain Webb. This is who we're talking about, British hero. Yeah, and he was he was he was amazing. He this was 1875 when he did this, and uh, when he swam the Channel, that is. And uh, after that, he tried. He didn't really stay famous. He tried to keep himself famous by doing these endurance events and things like that. But he found it quite hard. But I read that he was so famous that when he came back from the Channel swimming and he went back to his hometown with a band procession going on, he was so loved that even a pig <laughs> got up on its trotters to look at him as he went by. <laughs> <laughs> Did the pig know that it was taking part in a procession? <laughs> yeah. In 1883, just eight years after he was the hero of the nation, he tried to swim across a particular bit of the river uh, down from Niagara Falls, and it was extremely dangerous, and more than 10,000 people turned up to watch him, and he drowned there. Uh, he was dragged under a current, and his body was found a few days later, and he was doing it to try and provide for his family. So I was going through the newspaper archives, and before he did it, every single headline about what he was about to do said, you know, Webb engages in suicidal endeavour. Every headline went, a fool's errand, totally mad, everyone predicts he will die, there's a whirlpool about, you know, 20 yards down the river into which he will definitely be sucked and perish, and he went on and did it anyway. I just wonder if he read any of that. <laughs> he didn't like to read his own press he was a very <laughs> modest man but actually everyone thought that he would die when he swam the channel as well it was, it was 34 kilometres but it actually took him 64 kilometres to swim it because of all the currents and he just oh, went yeah. in a real zigzag he refused way. to ask for directions <laughs> <laughs> and he smothered himself in porpoise fat to keep warm oh, yeah. which nice. is quite good and um, towards the end he got really tired but then a boat went past and everyone on the boat started singing Rule Britannia to keep him going. <laughs> and I don't know if this would have been an encouragement or put him off, but apparently his coach, Arthur Payne, used to jump in occasionally and swim alongside him, <laughs> which I would find really irritating. <laughs> hey, man, this is easy. Yeah. <laughs> I read also at one stage that he had um, a run-in with a porpoise. <laughs> so why are you covered in porpoise fat? What have you done with my friends? <laughs> I think that might have been it. They might have confused him. Smells like a porpoise, looks like a porpoise. Uh, But there was actually someone who went across the channel before him. He was called Paul the Fearless Frogman Boynton. And um, he did manage to get it across, but he was wearing a rubber suit with a paddle and a sail. (laughs) He towed a boat behind him, I think, which had his uh, supplies in it. He towed a boat? He towed a boat. This is much more impressive than Matthew (laughs) Webb. I mean, he had a sail. I think he had some kind of a small, like, makeshift clockwork motor thing. (laughs) I'm I'm not sure where we draw the line at swimming, but I think that is not swimming. His suit sounds amazing. It could support you, so it helped you float in the water. And also, you could store nine days' worth of food in the pockets. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> basically, it was a publicity stunt to sell this suit because um, he called it the life-saving suit. <laughs> he was actually the guy... He um, set up the first ever theme park in America and then he set up what became Coney Island. Did he? Whoa. And then he befriended sea lions and used to appear in silent films with them all the time. But hang on. <laughs> <laughs> you just... They he were who we felt closest sea to. Lions. <laughs> yeah, he performed in films with sea lions. Did these sea lions know they were being befriended? <laughs> <laughs> um, there, even cooler than there was someone who swam across before even um, what was it? Paul the Amazing Frogman, Boyton, <laughs> Fearless yeah. Frogman. Um, it was a guy called uh, William Hoskins, and this was in 1862, and he kick paddled his way across on a bale of straw. <laughs> I was the first man to go across the channel, not in a boat. Do you guys know who the best living swimmer alive today is? Um, Michael mm. Phelps. Oh, uh, no. So this is for long distance um, oh, yeah. I'm talking. It's a guy called uh, Martin Strell. Okay. He had a lot of TV shows, so it actually might be a name familiar to those listening and those here tonight. Um, he's, uh, he's an amazing guy. He's a Slovenian, uh, long distance swimmer. He swam the entire Amazon River. First person ever to do that. The Danube, the Yangtze. Um, he, did the, he did the Danube in one go. He swam for 84 hours Whoa. straight. He lost 40 pounds by the time he got out. He was 40 pounds lighter. Wow. And along the way, and along every single swim that he does, he drinks two bottles of wine. He has just a favorite <laughs> white wine, I think it is, that he drinks. Are there sort of like um, thresher shops along the way? <laughs> the Amazon is much better provided for than I realized. Yeah. That's where thresher sharks get their name, actually. Oh, really? They're Come serving. on. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is how hardcore he is with his swimming. Um, he hasn't swum the Nile yet. And he's been asked, why have you not swum the Nile? And he said that it's neither long or challenging enough. Well, it is like the second longest river in the world. Yeah, I know. He said, it's just like a small creek. This guy is a liar. I say that when people say, why have you never fought a lion? They are neither large nor fierce enough for me. So <laughs> it's not worth me wasting my time. <laughs> um, we're going to have to move on in about two minutes. Can I, can I tell you one more guy who I found out about in terms of the annals of cross-channel swimming history? This is one of my favorite ever people. His name is Bob Platten. I don't know much about him but he crossed the channel on an iron bedstead in 1961, <laughs> which he had attached floating barrels to. Um, then in 1963, he surpassed himself. He went over on a barrel with an outboard motor. <laughs> Eventually, commercialism crept in. In 1969, he went across again in a shoe sponsored by British leather. <laughs> Um, and then in 1965, he crossed in a gin bottle what? sponsored by Gilby's Gin. Hang on, where do we get these oversized gin bottles? <laughs> Bob Platten, what a guy. Uh, okay, it's time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that the first item sold on eBay was a broken laser pointer. Yeah. And wow. it was bought by a man who collects broken laser pointers. <laughs> It genuinely was. Do you think wow. he ever buys working laser pointers and then breaks them <laughs> so that they can go in his collection? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess It's so. a good question, because you would have thought a working laser pointer is actually easier to come across than a broken laser yeah. pointer. Yeah. Hmm. The guy who sold it, did he know that someone might want a broken laser pointer, or it, was he, like, just scamming people? Or? It was the creator of, of eBay. So oh, yeah. prior to eBay being called eBay, it was called Auction Web. And Auction Web was his little sideline. There's a bit of a mythology that he set it up, he set eBay up, because his wife had a huge collection of Pez dispensers she wanted to get rid of, and he thought, <laughs> let's do it that way. And that was actually marketed, I think, through eBay themselves, saying that was the case. Turns out it's not true. But so it was the guy who set up eBay. So this guy who... Um, started eBay. Yeah. It was called Auction Web, but it was on eBay.com, I think. And he had some other sites on eBay.com as well. And one of them was an Ebola information site. Yeah. That was the first thing on eBay.com, a place to find out where Ebola's happening around yeah, the world. Yeah, he was weirdly obsessed with Ebola, right? Yeah. In the 90s, before it was kind of fashionable. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And... He employed a marketing guy who was like, you really have to take this Ebola shit down. No one wants yeah. it. People just want to buy stuff. Uh, another thing sold on eBay, um, or well, they tried to sell this and actually got taken off. Uh, Iceland, the country. Um, <laughs> and this was this part of the description. Bjork, not included. <laughs> there was, did you read about the musician who sold what he claimed was the world's longest hula hoop? Oh, wow. uh, so it was three inches. Um, and this was last year, I think. Whoa. And, uh, <laughs> Whoa. 
deal now. Andy, you missed out. <laughs> How much but did it, it go for? It went well. Someone bid seven hundred and twelve pounds for I it. Would, if I had known about this at the time, I'm I so would have, sorry. I would, I would cheerfully have paid three inches of hula hoop. But you know what's really <laughs> sad about this guy, or um, kind of nice? He said he was going to use any funds he raised off selling stuff on eBay to fund his commune that he wanted to set up. And uh, one of the things he first tried to sell was his love on eBay. <laughs> he put that up there. He said he was willing to sit quietly somewhere and send you good vibes and love for five pounds. Five pounds was the maximum he got for that. And then he got 712 for an oversized hula hoop. Yeah. Looking at Andy, I think you'd rather have the hula hoop. I would you? definitely rather have the hula hoop. <laughs> Can you imagine opening the packet and finding that? <laughs> It would be so exciting. I mean, the packets are barely four inches long. Intimate, you know. Sorry. Yes, but love, Andy, love. <laughs> I want a massive hula hoop. <laughs> There was actually, I know this seems implausible, but this was last year, and then there was a 26-year-old woman in March this year who found a bigger hula hoop, which she then put on eBay. <laughs> Did she get more for it? That or? was five inches long. I don't think she actually got offered as much, because the craze was sort of over by that point. I feel there isn't enough astonishment in the room about this. <laughs> the normal hula hoop is about a tenth as long as that. <laughs> um, so, uh, in 2004 there was a sale on eBay of some water that Elvis had left in a cup. Um, <laughs> it went for 237 quid, or the equivalent in dollars, and it was from a plastic cup that he'd sipped from in North Carolina in 1977. But isn't it true that the person who sold it kept the cup? He kept the cup, yes. <laughs> kept the cup. So he sent, he, would, he sent out the water, but the cup was... yeah. And oh he, he, said, he said at the time, I promise this thing is 100% legitimate. <laughs> Or did it have a certificate that went with it with him just writing, seriously, I promise. <laughs> um, can I mention a few things about lasers very yeah, quickly? Yeah. Because so he broke this, uh, the fact was a broken laser pointer. Um, I read that the, the sort of founding father of laser technology died just this year. Charles Towns, he, he originally came up not with the laser, he sort of had the one just before, it was called the Maser. Um, <laughs> but I mean, how amazing that that's, he was able to see how far it's come and you know he made it into yeah, yeah. a Bond movie with his invention Bond's yeah. crotch was almost burnt off wasn't it by but his invention in the novel <laughs> apparently it was a circular saw that he was attacked by rather than a laser really apparently ah. but they uh, put the laser in the movie to make it a bit more exciting what, the way what? that they worked it is they had a special effects man underneath the table and he was burning um, cutting through the table from beneath with a kind of a torch. And um, apparently, because he was doing that, it meant that um, Sean Connery was sweating and worried in the mm -hmm. same way that he would have been if a laser was yeah. coming from above. Because not only was this kind of being cut from below, the guy below couldn't see where he was cutting to. <laughs> <laughs> and also, when the director wants the, the shot to end, he'll shout, cut. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this, this guy, Charles Towns, uh, when he invented the laser, uh, everyone, or as he was proposing it, he needed funding and he asked for funding and everyone in the scientific community thought that he was insane, that it wouldn't work, it was going against certain laws that were in place uh, about physics and, and the world. And they said that this is, yeah. <laughs> Why, Dr. Schreiber, please, can't understand the word you're saying. <laughs> we have a lay audience here. <laughs> Yeah, so science uh, <laughs> said that it couldn't work. And so he, he still went along with it. And Niels Bohr, who's you know, a very famous physicist, said this is not going to work to the point where eventually a few scientists said we need to write to him. We, they, we actually know the letter that was sent to him, which was by Isidore Isaac Rabi. And this is genuine. Look, you should stop the work you are doing. It isn't going to work. You know it's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. <laughs> You're wasting money. Just stop. <laughs> And then three months later was the first successful experiment of the laser. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. Someone's used a laser cutter to imprint a song onto a tortilla. <laughs> <laughs> it should be, for it to work best, it should be an uncooked tortilla if you wanted to try it. And they printed a Mexican dance onto it. It didn't sound very good, actually, but you can watch on YouTube. Charles Towns would, I think, be glad to know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, we're going to have to move on to our next fact, and that is Chazinski. Uh, yes, my fact is that uh, when Alexander Fleming's neighbours foiled a burglary at his house, as a thank you gift, he gave them some mould. Mm. <laughs> uh, this is kind of uh, predictable, possibly, for everyone who knows who Alexander Fleming is. He gave them the mould, 
not just some mold. So he gave them the like first penicillin culture. Uh, so these guys, it was really shortly before he died actually, and his neighbors uh, saw burglars uh, trying to burgle his house, and they stopped them and they called the police, and then they received a letter shortly afterwards from Alexander Fleming and Mrs. Go- Montgomery, his housekeeper, um, saying, "Look, enclosed is some mold." Um, and then Mrs. Montgomery clarified. She wrote something along the lines of, "As though you didn't know, but just in case." This said affair is a blob of the original mold of penicillin, not to be confused with gorgonzola cheese. <laughs> now, I was going to say, how did they know it was the original mold? It's a bit like Elvis's water, isn't it? It's just a letter saying, no, it really is the original mold. And they kept the Petri dish that it had grown in, actually. It just gave them the mold. Yeah. <laughs> Fleming had a very high star rating on eBay, so I think he was, a, he was a trustworthy seller by that point. So this just went up for auction, didn't it? Oh, it sure did, yeah. Yeah, do you yeah. know how much it sold for? Go on. Was it £712 in a hotly contested race with a three-inch long hula hoop? <laughs> and you don't know how eBay works. <laughs> Which one will I get, the hula hoop or the mould? <laughs> Andy just bids for everything on eBay in the hope that one day a hula hoop comes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it sold for £4,720. Do you, are you thinking that's not much? I'm pissed off. That's such an achievable amount to this buy. Is, I'm so glad you said this. this is exact, I wanted to call you up and say, why didn't we get together and buy this, yeah, guys? I think we you don't need to earn them. too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to have so a word awkward. with our boss. <laughs> <laughs> but he discovered it really far before it was used uh, in medicine, didn't he? He discovered it in about yeah. 1928. Yeah. And then he wrote a paper on it saying this has antibiotic properties. This could be very useful. You couldn't quite get it working. That was yeah, and nobody paid any attention for another 10 years. There was this huge argument over who had really invented it or made it useful for mankind. Oh, did they argue over it? Because they shared the Nobel Prize, uh, Florian, Chain and Fleming. It was a guy called uh, Almroth Wright who worked with Fleming who wrote a letter to the Times saying, actually, it was me who came up with that, not him. Wow. And then the press all went down to speak to both of them. Fleming worked for this big company, actually, and he was, you know, he did find it, but he worked for this big company and he was just like a small cog in it, really. Um, But the press went down to speak to them. But the reason that we all kind of know Fleming today is because he had such a good story. He came from a humble background. He supposedly came up with it serendipitously, like there was a little Petri dish on his desk and it just accidentally grew. And yeah. it was just a better story. And the other story was like basically a group of international researchers working in state. Boring! <laughs> <laughs> Snore. That was it. There was the accidental discovery. He went away for a trip. And yeah. then he came yeah. back and he found that there, he had a load of bacterial cultures and one of them, the bacteria weren't growing. And it was because the mould had supposedly drifted in through the window. I, I read a really interesting set of articles about the idea that they think that um, that he got to his to, to noticing what was going on because he was an artist. He, he painted, he painted a lot, but he didn't use actual colours that you would buy in shops and so on, he grew his colours in, yeah. in Petri dishes. He yeah. would like have this Petri dish with different microbes in there and some of them would grow green and that would be the grass, some would grow blue, that would be the, uh, the sky and it would just make these beautiful little images. And the great thing was is they would only last for a few like days and then they would all grow into each other so it was really a trend. That's amazing, isn't that crazy? So he used to paint things like ballerinas, horses, mothers feeding children, stick figures fighting. I mean that's <laughs> that's pretty cool. Conveniently they didn't last long because after a few days they disappeared so we have no evidence they were any good at all. <laughs> well but... he used to show them to people and people wrote about them and one day he showed them to Queen Mary who said I don't see the point of these. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, he was Alexander Fleming was very bad at conversation, <laughs> and his on his entry on the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, um, this was how someone put it: as one visitor put it, talking with him was like playing tennis with a man who, whenever you knock the ball over to his side, put it in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Oxford that is DMV. such a good description of so many conversations we've all had yeah. <laughs> with James. Um, <laughs> I call I a fault on that. that. Uh, <laughs> he did say, I really like this quote from him, uh, when he was interviewed about discovering penicillin, he said, when I woke up just after dawn on September 28th, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionise all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic. But I suppose that was exactly what I did. Wow. I reckon whenever you had a conversation with him, that was always his reply to no matter what you said. Um, here's something cool about penicillin. So, uh, after they, so in about the late 30s, 38, 39, um, it was really, really costly and very, very labour-intensive to make more of it. And you needed 2,000 litres of mould culture fluid to get enough pure penicillin to treat a single patient. 
Um, so obviously that was you know, incredibly time-consuming and difficult and laborious. So to make up the shortfall, the researchers extracted it from the urine of patients who had already taken it. So when you take penicillin, 40 to 99% of it is excreted about four hours later because your kidney's very good at getting rid of it. Um, so you could take the urine, crystallize it, extract the penicillin, give it to the patient in the next bed. How weird is that? Wow, that is strange. So So you're literally taking the piss. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This confused me about, so the original fact about the penicillin being sold on eBay, in the Scientific American article where I initially read this, uh, the title was, Fleming's Original Penicillin Culture Sold at Auction... And then there was a little note at the bottom, a correction, saying, in tiny writing, this article was originally published with the title, Old Mold Sold. <laughs> I just thought, why did you change that? Um, so Penicillin Camembertie is the mold which is used to make camembert, uh, and it's naturally green. And so camembert always used to be green. And then suddenly it started to get a bit whiter. And then humans selected it to get whiter and whiter and whiter. And now it's white. But only a few hundred years ago, camembert was all green. Wow. So is, is it good for you if you take camembert it's, um, three times a day? <laughs> I would say it's worth a try. Yeah. <laughs> In ancient Egypt, didn't they used to whack mouldy bread onto their wounds? I think they did, and they thought that that was one of the first uses of the effects of penicillin. Yeah. The century did the and the way thing. that they used to make camembert is they used to get bread and put it in a cave, and then the bread would get mouldy and mouldy and mouldy, and then they'd get the bread out and then kind of turn it into a dust, and then they put the dust into the cheese, and that's how they got camembert. Ah. Yeah. We're going to have to move on. i got one last thing. Um, penicillin, the name itself, penicillin, he didn't come up with for quite a few months. Uh, so he had a working title. I think they should have kept it Mold Juice. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. Okay, time for our final fact of the evening, and that is James Harkin. Okay, my fact this week is that the earliest known ice cream recipe suggests flavoring with poo. <laughs> If this yeah. is what haagen Belgian chocolate is, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> uh, no, they offered lots of different things. Orange flower water was one of the things, and the other one was ambergris, which is whale poo. Oh. Yeah, so no human poo. Oh, everyone's so disappointed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, ambergris is um, sperm whale poo. Uh, it's when a sperm whale eats a squid, and the beak is indigestible, and so its body creates mucus and vomity covering of the squid's beak, uh, and then it expels it almost always through the anus, and people in the olden days really liked the taste of it, and they described it as earthy and mildly fecal. Wow. <laughs> and apparently this was the kind of thing you flavoured ice cream with back in the day. <laughs> So cool. It floats around, doesn't it, on the sea for months or sometimes years? Yeah. Um, because only about one percent of sperm whales produce ambergris, and there aren't there aren't that many sperm whales. Yeah. Um, and so as it as it floats, it, yeah. it hardens and it changes and it takes on a much more perfumey aroma than you would think it would have. Apparently, and, it's amazing. And it's worth a fortune if you find it yeah. on the shore because it's what they use. For... Although in some countries you're not allowed to sell it, and a lot of places use fake amber green ale. But um, yeah, if you can find a buyer, you can sell it for a lot of money because it's used in perfume, right? So uh, yeah, it used to be at least. Well, a lot of uh, perfume companies. So there's actually a really good book on this called Floating Gold, um, but. <laughs> Perfume companies tend to deny that they use it, but uh, this guy found a lot of people who sell ambergris to a lot of companies like Chanel, etc. Um, so yeah, they still use, and apparently it does smell delicious and incredible. The worst thing about it is to make it to put the stuff into the food, you would make tincture of ambergris, and to make that, you had to warm it very slowly. And the way that they would do that is either put it in the sun, but if it wasn't sunny, you would put it in hot dung. <laughs> Oh, wow. So if it wasn't fecal enough, you had to make it a little bit more fecal before putting it in your ice cream. Wow. I have a story about on the, the finding it thing, oh, yeah. finding it um, on the beach. So uh, in 2013, there was a dog water uh, on a beach in Lancashire, and he found a three-kilo lump, and that is huge. I mean, you yeah. get some, as small as 15 grams of the lumps of ambergris, and uh, reports said it could be worth up to £100,000, and uh, one French expert offered him €50,000 if it checked out, and he said... It smelled horrible. I left it, came back home, and looked it up on the internet. When I saw how much it could be worth, I went back and grabbed it. (laughs) And then there was another story in the same newspaper two months later, which revealed it wasn't ambergris. (laughs) And he said, if I had my time again, I would kick the rock to one side and walk away. I wish I'd never found it. (laughs) I read that article as well, and it said it turned out to be just a smelly rock. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, can we can we talk about poo very quickly? Yes, please. Okay, okay cool. Um, there's a museum in Tasmania called Mona. If you don't know Mona, it's, it's very famous, very good museum. It's incredible. Best gallery I've ever been oh, to in okay. my life, by the so way. There, yeah. There's an art exhibition in the Mona Museum uh, that takes a poo at 2 p.m. every day. <laughs> Sorry, the exhibition itself takes a poo. a very sick museum employee. <laughs> <laughs> They've erected a little plaque next to him. He's there going... He's been trying to pass it off as... No, it must have been the museum that did the poo. <laughs> They have an installation which uh, has been designed by someone which replicates the actions of a human digestive system. So it starts, it gets fed twice a day, and at 2 p.m. every day, it produces a poo and lets out the poo. Great. Yeah, they did it because they had a really successful exhibit just before it called The Vomit Room. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Sounds like an amazing museum. They call it the Adults Disneyland. It is. (laughs) I mean, is it still a poo? Again, we've gone philosophical, but I think that's worth um, sort of... Mm. All right. Um, so stuff on ice cream, maybe. Yeah. Uh, in Uttar Pradesh in 2007, you could buy something called Hitler ice cream. Uh, and this was basically ice cream with a big picture of Hitler on it. It wasn't, it wasn't flavoured. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and apparently the people there didn't really realise the problem with doing such a thing. The guy who was selling it when interviewed said, one of my uncles is a short-tempered and strict man, so we nicknamed him Hitler and we called it after him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good excuse. Uh, yeah. But it's, they have form, actually, in India. In, 2000, in the same year, actually, in Mumbai, there was a home furnishing firm who um, did bedsheets called the Nazi Collection, which were full of swastikas. Uh, but when they were asked about it, they said that Nazi stood for New Arrival Zone for India. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh Very quick thinking, actually. Yeah. Um, did you guys know that Ben & Jerry's has an ice cream flavour graveyard? <laughs> no, uh, really? It's so cool. So it's for every ice cream flavour that has died over the years, which is actually quite a lot. So it's very sad. Um, and they, it's a real graveyard. They've got tombstones in there. What? And they've got the name of the ice cream on the tombstones. And then they've, all, they've written a little individual poem for each ice cream that's died a, a terrible death. Um, and it's brilliant. So some examples are the ice cream uh, sweaty balls. Uh, <laughs> Why on earth did they get rid of that? It's, it's so impossible to know. <laughs> Seems like what a did it taste like? Uh, <laughs> I don't think we need to answer that. Uh, no, apparently that was based on a Saturday Night Live sketch from the '90s, where Alec Baldwin, Baldwin talks about sweaty balls ice cream. I don't know, but um, yeah, that that did not last very long. There's a Vermonty Python ice cream, which also died. Oh yeah, and the poem there is <laughs> right then is it dead or isn't it no it isn't yes it is no it isn't rubbish you're a loony no I'm not <laughs> quite good <laughs> <laughs> makes sense right doesn't it yeah great <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I feel like I might be the only person that didn't know this but um, I didn't realise that haagen wasn't a real name in terms of I thought haagen the ice cream was called haagen because either there were two people one called Hagen, one called Daz yeah that sounds um, reasonable what, but it, so what it was was a Polish guy who lived in New York and he wanted just a nice Danish sounding name and his daughter said uh, they would sit around the table and he'd be like Splagen Mars Vegan Bars Vegan Daz Hagen <laughs> and they went that sounds good that's why they called it it was him around the dinner table going Hagen Daz Hagen Daz and they named it that well, same for uh, Rolex there really? are lots really? of very vexed etymologies we don't really know where it comes from there are a few theories about it but they all contradict each well, other well they think so. they just made it up because it sounded nice or? Maybe, yeah, yeah, that's uh, one of the theories. Uncle Ben's rice is made by... Don't tell me Uncle Ben doesn't exist, James. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Come on. It was made by a German guy, German company, and they called it Uncle Ben's to make it sound more American. Oh, damn it. Wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> um, Mr. Whippy, uh, do you know where that came from? You know Mr. Whippy or Soft Scoop, if you're American? Um, ice cream. <laughs> Is it not a story that it came from Margaret Thatcher or something? Yeah, there's a, theory, there's a story that Margaret Thatcher was on the original team which developed Mr. Whippy ice cream, but I think it's not really true, is it? It's, she was, I think she was a chemist for the, for the company, company at the time. Yeah, and she did work on ice cream, but not specifically on that. Ah. But the time that we came up with the idea of like softer ice cream as a concept, a revolutionary idea, as everyone agrees, uh, is this guy called Tom Carvel, who is an American, and he just sold ice cream, and his truck broke down in some really hot American state, he got a flat tire and so he had to pull over and his ice cream all started melting and he was like oh bugger what do I do with this and someone came up and said oh can I buy that 
and he realized they had a, a just moving ice cream stall and people wanted to buy melting ice cream. And so he stayed there. He set up shop next to a pottery shop, I think. Wow. Um, and that's how where Mr. Whippy came, was melting ice cream accidentally. Wow. Another accidental invention, much like yeah. penicillin. Yeah. I didn't mean to revolutionize ice cream when I got up today. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we need to wrap up. We need, we've, we've run out of time, everyone. Um, okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to get in contact with any of us about the stuff we've said over the course of this podcast, we can all be found on Twitter. I'm on at Schreiberland. Andy? At Andrew Hunter M. James? At Eggshaped. Chazinski? Uh, you can email podcast at qi.com. Yep, and you can also head to no such thing as a fish.com. That's our website where all of our previous episodes are up there or go to our Twitter handle at QI Podcast. We'll be back again next week. Thank you so much, everyone who's here. Thank you guys so much for coming along. And uh, yeah, we'll see you then. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>